some of you may know that I spoke about GDD at NDC Oslo about seven years ago, and it caused a little bit of a, um, uh, you know, amount of attention. And I, I really wanted to kind of return to it almost well, seven years later now um, and try and put a little bit more structure around some of the guidance um, that I would give you doing GDD today. So whereas that prior talk was an exciting rant, um, this talk is probably slightly more uh, structured in, in how we're looking basically at this stuff today. Okay, most of you know this, it's kind of dull, it means I'm old, I've got a lot of slides to get through, let's kind of move over who Mr. Cooper is. Um, I work on an open source project for C Sharp and Python called Brighter. We love to have contributors. Um, we do the same thing as Mediator does, but we also do basically uh, over middleware and uh, messaging middleware like RabbitMQ and Kafka if you need it to. All right, so what we're going to talk about, um, the bulk of this session will be about fallacies and a principle that you should use instead uh, for TDD um, that I see still permeating the industry. Um, and then I will talk a little bit about clean architecture, a very short section, because it's useful, I think, to understand how it can fit into helping our TDD practice. And we'll get a little summary at the end. All right. So what do I think some of the key fallacies are that we, we, we still propagate in the industry? This, to me, is the biggest one. Um, this idea that we have that developers write unit tests. Nothing could be further from the truth if we're doing TDD. So if we look at how uh, Wikipedia defines uh, unit testing, it says um, that to isolate issues that may arise, uh, substitutes such as method stubs, mock objects, fakes, and test harnesses can be used to assist testing a module in isolation. What's all that about? Well, the isolation piece is key to what people are trying to do with unit testing. The original, it comes from very classical uh, testing and you, your software be divided into modules. You treat each module like a black box and you say, I will test this black box in isolation of all the other black boxes. And I will therefore know that any failures relate to something that's happened inside my black box. And to do that, what I have to do is make sure that the black box doesn't, anything that it talked to outside the box, any connections it had to other modules, I replace those with some kind of substitute. Right. And so generally, where this practice has been taken into the world of test driven development, we've said the unit is essentially my class and therefore anything my class talks to, I have to mock out. My class is essentially my old school module and I'm using this unit testing practice to basically do that. Okay. And at its height, what this led to was this idea that became known as need driven development. Um, particularly strongly advocated uh, often by what's called the London School, um, uh, as opposed to the Chicago School, which is more we'll talk about later. Um, and uh, so, for example, uh, Steve Freeman and Nat Price is growing object oriented software tests. Uh, and need driven development is this idea of outside in, where essentially you say, I start at the outside, I move in, as I find things that I may later need to build, I kind of mock them out. Um, and then I go away and I build one of those things that I've mocked out and I mock out. And as I build it, I mock out things it needs. And I start basically um, until I get down to everything basically that has been mocked now has a concrete replacement. So it, it, it requires a couple of things that we have to do. The first is we either have to work in this very top down fashion where we start with a test at the outer layer and we say, right, in order to fill in the details, I'm going to need a thing. I can't have a concrete thing because this thing basically is only allowed to talk to itself. Therefore, I need to mock out those things, right? And so you write a test and as you go to implement stuff, you say, well, I need to mock out that operation. I'll put a mock in my test. I need to mock out that operation. I'll put a mock in my test. I need to mock out that operation, put a mock in my test. My test setup's got all these mocks now, which basically are defining the contract of what I will be calling. And, and effectively my test is generating those mocks. And there's a bit of a problem there in the I don't like my, my test gets written as I'm writing the implementation. And the classical TDD model says, hey, red, write a failing test, then green, go to implement it, then red, go to refactor. But I'm, I'm, I'm tying red and green together horribly here. And my refactoring step often doesn't happen because I've spent so much time thinking about the implementation. So really, I'm just directly writing the code 
and the test is being written at the same point. And I might as well be testing after. Yeah. The other model you can do this with is literally to get CRC cards and I can do upfront design. Okay. And say, oh, I'm going to go and create the design of all my objects. And then I know what I'm going to call. So I can then put the mock statements in when I write my test, um, because I know that it's going to call all those, all those other classes. Uh, and then effectively I can write my test uh, now ahead of my class. And as I get to my implementation, I'll make those calls to the mocks I've defined early. But you've still done upfront design. Your entire class hierarchy, you, you fleshed out. And your TDD is no longer giving you feedback as you go along uh, on your code. Um, so the, the, the consequence of this approach is that we don't do TDD in the sense of TDD as a contract first approach to writing our code. The idea behind TDD is that I develop the contract that my code will present to express a given behavior that is needed by the system. This approach is about designing a class hierarchy and testing it afterwards. And even if you're pretty much writing the, the tests simultaneously with the code, you're not really doing tests first. You are trapped in a pattern of test after, where you're getting feedback on the design that already exists, rather than your design being improved in your refactoring step. So I spoke about this as far back as 2007. Right? And we talked about this basically idea of a fragile test something where effectively we're saying, um, hey, uh, these tests essentially are not particularly robust because of the mocking. And the issue becomes that as um, soon as I have to inject a lot of stuff into my code, right, which may not necessarily be the right design. So I end up with a model that says, my class takes interfaces of everything it can't just new up a collaborator in its constructor and use it. It must be passed into it as a dependency. That dependency must be some kind of abstraction. So in a strongly typed language, it would be an interface um, in a uh, dynamic language. Basically, we have to use some kind of duct typing um, to replace it. And that's led us into this world of um, I've got IOC containers now because every object that I have has uh, a depend has dependencies, and those dependencies have dependencies, and those dependencies have dependencies, and the graph gets complicated and big. And we need an IOC container to realize it. And yet, if we didn't have that, if we just said, I'm going to new up one of these, I don't need to inject it, um, we might be able to get away with poor man's DI at the composition root without and not actually use an IOC container at all. So, a lot of this thing people complain about, which is says, Oh, we've got this crazy world. Everything's the interface and everything's IOC, et cetera. A huge amount of that comes from this testing strategy. I wanted to be able to replace the things that my classes depend upon as a result of testing. If I didn't have that, in many cases, I would never have surfaced those things outside. I'd have surfaced them if I was doing basically something like the open close principle, where essentially I wanted to have different strategies around which my code varied and I wanted to pass them in. I might have surfaced them if I had a layer boundary issue where I was needed to depend on something that's above me. But those are genuine software design concerns. Um, I wouldn't have surfaced, I wouldn't have those interfaces injected into my code just because of a testing requirement. And the problem becomes with all of those statements inside my uh, test, which tell me exactly how this code interoperates with its neighbors is that if I want to change any of my neighbors, then I'm going to break all of those tests. And my experience of this was very, in, in the past was very much uh, on these lines. I once worked on a uh, system where we built, um, God help us, our own ORM uh, and for, for reasons. Um, and one of the problems, the things we did, we did there was basically mock it very heavily because we were at you know, that stage of our understanding of TDD. Um, and it would spit out basically relevant basically calls to database. We would check what database calls you were going to make, and we would assert this thing works you know, perfectly. But it was completely unchangeable because as soon as you tweaked one thing over here in your code basically to represent, I want a new parameter, huge numbers of our tests would break. And that, and that behavior sensitivity problem where you change one thing, you get a sea of red 
and all your mocks start a failing. You need to go through and literally correct all your mocks. It's a huge problem because the promise of TDD is around refactoring, right? We end up with what we call overspecified software. Right? My test has become coupled to my implementation details. My test understands how I intend to implement that code. My test should not be coupled to my implementation details. Right? The, I should not be thinking to myself, in order to basically change this behavior, I have to change these tests. The tests should assert a behavior continuously. And if you change a behavior, you should only change the test that basically exercises that behavior, not every test inside. All right. So what's the kind of equivalent principle to this? Well, the principle that we're looking for much more is that developers write what we call developer tests. Well, why, is, why is that different? Well, it's important to understand that Kent um, uh, never effectively uh, talked about unit tests. In fact, if you read his book, TDD by example, uh, he only uses the, sent the, the word unit test once, and he uses that to say that he doesn't actually use unit tests. That's the only reference in the book. What's happened is that in casual conversation, people would refer to unit testing and tools like JUnit and XUnit, essentially an N unit kind of effectively established this, the word unit as part of the terminology. And people looked at that and said, oh, unit testing, there's tons of uh, advice out there about unit testing. And oh, look, if I've got unit tests, I need integration tests. Oh, and I need acceptance tests. And people bought the whole farm of unit testing, but that was never anything that was described originally by TDD. Doesn't, it's just not there, right? Um, so what, 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 what should we actually be writing, right? Well, one of the key things that gives us a bit of a clue is refactoring. Right. Remember that the cycle is red, green, and refactor. And in red, we write a failing test. We're essentially saying that there's some behavior in the system. We want to basically prove that the code under test provides that. And initially, we'll write something red, so we know that our test will genuinely fail because the behavior's not there yet. We then go green, using the cheapest approach that we can to get green. We copy and paste stuff out of Stack Overflow. Um, uh, we ask questions on Twitter and paste lines of code from Twitter if we need to. The goal is to find the algorithm and not to write good code. Right? Once we have an algorithm that makes the code, the test go green, we then do design. We do design the refactoring step. And the purpose of refactoring is to improve our implementation but not change our behavior. Okay. And by the behavior, what we mean is the contract that your API that you are developing expresses with the world. Now I use the word API generically, the public methods on a class are an API, right? I don't mean in the sense HTTP or REST or anything like that. But your contract is what you effectively are discovering by the process of TDD. You care about that outside, not about the internals. So the key idea here is that once I've got that contract established, I know what the behavior of this class should be. I can then go in my refactoring step and improve the design. I can keep changing it and provided it stays green, I know that the changes I'm making are safe. I'm still preserving the behavior that I wanted. Make a little change to the behavior, test is still green. Make a little the implementation, check, check it's still green. Make a little change to the implementation, check it's still green. Make a little change to the implementation, check it's, check it's still green. And I can keep building out this implementation, right? One of the things that people often miss is if I essentially, as part of the refactoring process, need to break out a class because I decide this thing's got too many responsibilities, I want to break out a class that's going to be essentially private to my module, internal, for example, in C sharp or underscore and say Python effectively, I don't write tests for that. It's covered by the tests that cover the behavior, right? I already have code coverage for it. The code coverage comes from the test that I'm currently writing. 
right? That doesn't need a separate test. When our behavior is stable, we don't need to change the tests, okay? So Kent basically um, posted a, basically a set of uh, test principles, and he, this was one of, one of the key ideas, right? If our contract does not change, if the API that we are currently dealing with, in other words, the public exports from a given module don't change, right? Then no tests should need to change if what we're doing is going in and changing some of our implementation detail. We should better change the implementation of our classes and never break any tests. And if our strategy around mocking means that as soon as we change implementation details, our tests break because the mocks effectively now need changing, we're doing it wrong. So Ken basically uh, on Twitter uh, quite recently said this, right? Test should have coupled to the behavior of the code and be coupled from the structure of the code, seeing tests that fell on both counts. And what he means by that is by the behavior, he means the contract that the class is expressing, right? So that's what we couple to. We don't couple essentially to the implementation details. And one of the things you find when mentally you switch this approach, you find a couple of very interesting things. First is essentially that you begin to actually do a proper red green refactoring process because you stop doing design up front of your implementation details, which is, which is a requirement of effectively a unit testing approach. It's why people basically say, oh, I'm going to test after because they, because they, because they can't see a difference because they don't, they don't genuinely experience a red green refactor uh, approach. So you find that you're refactoring more, you find that you're suspending design decisions until the refactoring step. And you find that your tests now reach that laudable XP goal of being documentation for your code, because you have clear examples of how to use your contract. And often when I look at, you know, test suites that I've seen out there, they're just a spray of mocks. Um, you know, even if someone basically then factors all those mocks out, or worse, use some horrific auto mocking kind of fixture, um, which is basically uh, bad or wrong fun if you've got it anyway. Um, uh, but use that kind of approach. You can't see very easily what is the contract? What is the example? How would I do this in my own code? You should better look at the test and say, oh, that's how I use that feature. Great. Hey, I can cut and paste the code out the test pretty much, put it in what I need, and then just alter it to my own purposes. That's what tests are for. And so Ken basically said, uh, this basically in a conversation that was facilitated by Martin um, Fowler effectively between himself and DHH after DHH said I'm giving up on um, TDD there was a kind of silly conversation and a lot of the conversation came around to this particular topic that the problem was people had misunderstood what TDD was and were practicing unit testing and had gone into this whole world of mock wide dependencies and Ken said basically I don't go very far down the mock path right your test is completely coupled to the implementation of the interface. Of course, you can't change anything without breaking the tests. So tests shouldn't be looking to use mocks to isolate the system under test. Right? Tests are not unit tests. And the consequences, basically, of using mocks to reserve indirect outputs is that you couple your test to your details. Right. So. Um, the TD community has known this for quite a long time and been quite open about it. It's just that people don't really listen. Um, so if you go to the C2 wiki, and if you really want to understand anything much about TDD, XP, things that come out of that area, the C2 wiki is still a useful repository of knowledge. But this dates to the mid noughties um, And it defined the following. It said, any unit test fairly implicates one and one only unit. The way that you get defect localization is you say, I've got localization because it must be in that black box, which is isolated. Okay. In TDD, we write programmer tests, sometimes called developer tests. Right? And failure implicates the most recent edit. Your localization is to what you just changed. If you work test by test, right? You do a little bit of work, run the tests. Do a little bit of work, run the tests, a little bit of work, run the tests. 
the amount of code that essentially calls red tests is probably four or five lines that you just changed. You have absolutely got defect localization because it's something you just added. And a lot of TDT advocates say, if you get unexpected red, what do you do? You revert, you revert that change. And then you go and do it again. And this time you try and get it so that you don't basically make red. Now, actually, I'm not as strict as that. I tend to say, you know, maybe sometimes debugging that's helpful because I don't really understand immediately what went wrong. And a little bit of debugging might actually help me understand. Oh, oh yeah, I see what went wrong. Okay, maybe then I'll revert and rewrite it. Maybe then I can just, I can fix and change it, right? But TDD is about doing programmer or developer testing, right? We don't really use mocks. Okay. Um, where Failey implicates the most recent edit. Um, and well, it's a contract first approach where we are designing the API for a module. Uh, and it is that contract effectively and its expression that we want to see in the tests, not um, isolation code, mock-up code, et cetera. Right. And of course, once you get rid of unit tests, you also basically throw things like integration tests in the trash bin too. Right? That distinction doesn't really exist. It never has done in TDD. Okay. So this is basically the definition that you need to basically kind of get get internalized on the C2 wiki. Tester and development produces developer tests, fairly implicates the developer's most recent edit. You don't need to use mock objects and you avoid debug debugging if you can by reverting that last edit. Okay. That's what test driven development is. Right. So TD is a process of discovery. Um, and, and don't use mocks, right? Okay. Um, now, having said that, right, having pushed you in that direction, there are a couple of cases where uh, Kent originally in TDD, by example, describes using mocks, right? So mocks and all those things are actually part of the original first book that came out. And uh, one of the key things we need from TDD is it's fast binary feedback. It must be fast, right? Uh, and to do that, we need to avoid things that basically will slow us down. The other thing is we must be able to run all of our tests together. Right? So we need to avoid things that cause problems where there's shared state where, the, where one test could impact another test. So tests are isolated from each other, we need to run them, run them in parallel. Okay. And typically the problem becomes what we call a shared fixture, a database, a file, something where multiple tests uh, talking to it could cause one test out to influence the other. And that's a condition for using a mock, right? where essentially you want to replace a piece of shared fixture and say, I'm just going to basically replace that with some kind of in-memory dummy that can effectively be very easily recreated for an individual test. And you can do this stuff by doing something like tearing, you know, creating and tearing down your database with every single test. But the problem with that basically is it becomes slow, right? And so what we need to do is make sure that what we, what, is we keep speed as well as basically isolation of tests from each other. And that means we quite commonly think about using some kind of test double uh, to replace shared fixture components. That's typically IO. We can also use mocks where, effect, where, where essentially tests become fragile because they're talking to, say, for example, across the network to some third party service, which may or may not be available. And we don't really want to have a dependency on that for our test. It's slow and, and effectively it's fragile, right? But that's all we really want to use mocks for. And that's all the, the whole reason mocks were included in the original book is to solve problems with shared fixture, solve problems with slow tests, solve problems with fragile tests. That's the reason to use mocks, not isolation dependencies. The second real problem we see out there is this idea that the trigger for a new test is a new function. We see people writing something saying, oh yeah, I need a new method in my class. I better spin up and write a test for that. And even Wikipedia has this line saying, um, what you do is you write a test that defines a function or improvements to a function. So this idea is it's focusing on the function as the key unit of abstraction that we're dealing with, right? And in particular, we're seeing TDD as this idea of preconditions and postconditions. That we've got some things that are true before a function is called and things that are true after a function is called. And the test simply asserts and it's set up that given this preconditions, we have these post conditions. And typically in a kind of OO world, we're, we're looking at some kind of object in its state. And we're saying, 
it had this state before I run this method I had and it has this state after. And that leads us to very much fun to focus on, hey, every function that I have on my class requires a test. And I even see people having conversations saying, oh, how do you test the private methods on your class, right? Um, so that becomes a bit of a problem, right? Um, because people start to believe that this function is the system under test. I'm thinking all the time about functions and how, and how I test them. Uh, and even there's lots of ideas around parameterized testing are really about how can I exercise the different possible combinations that my, my function expresses, right? Um, uh, people start to talk about test coverage and say, do I really need to test this getter and setter? Because, you know, do I, 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 that's, a, that's a function on my class. Um, should I test my getters and setters? And they get lost in this whole conversation about, well, maybe you don't really need 100% test coverage, getters and setters can't fail. Um, and it's really a pointless discussion because this is not our goal, right? And quite often where we look at this model of mocks and unit tests and functions being the target, we end up in this world where we say, well, we have to have these acceptance tests um, because what we've tested in our TDD is these fine grains of our application. Um, but we need bigger tests to test they all fit together. So we'll have to have integration tests and we'll have to have acceptance tests because it turns out TDD isn't testing our system. It's testing these tiny little atomic units of our system, right? And again, that's not true. That's not what we're trying to achieve. Now, the problem with these tests is they're very much focused on, um, I'm going to provide you um, uh, some parameters, basically, to the test, uh, and I'm going to produce an output. But I'm going to tell you very little about why you might be calling that function. Um, what is the behavior in the domain that we are trying to basically encode that we are looking at? I can't often see that. I can just see, hey, I've got this method called do something. And it adds five to seven, um, and it seems to come back with the answer of 26. I don't understand. Why, why would it do that, right? And nothing in the test tells me. Maybe there's some mocks in there that help us uh, why, how it does that. But nothing in the test tells me, right? And that's not the point. There's this whole notion, essentially, we had of executable specifications that I wouldn't need to do documentation anymore because I could go and read the tests, right? People laugh at this idea, and they go, uh, I, I go and look at my test suite. There's no way I can live with that documentation because, um, uh, you know, look at the test. You couldn't possibly interpret the system from the tests. This whole idea is wrong. And they never ask themselves, maybe it's my test that is wrong. Maybe my tests are just so badly written. That's why I can't do that. And so it's not the idea that's the problem. It's the way people have been writing tests that's the problem. You write tests the wrong way and you can't clearly see what's going on. All right. So from the from the dawn of TDD, right? This has been the this has been this has been the actual statement that was made. The trigger for a new test is a new behavior. From the dawn of TDD, that has been basically what TDD has been about. Right. This is an example in Kent's book of what you are testing. We are testing that we need to be able to add amounts in two different currencies and convert the result given a set of exchange rates. I'm not testing a function. I'm not testing a particular class hierarchy that I've developed with CRC cards. I am testing a requirement. That is a TDD test, right? right. Nowadays, we tend to rewrite these as given a set of exchange rates. When we add amounts in two different currencies, then we convert the result. But this is exactly what TDD was talking about from the very, very beginning, right? So if I rewrite that, given a set of exchange rates, when I add two amounts in different currencies together, then I get a result in the first currency. We get a classic, uh, what we think of now basically as, you know, given when then test, right? Given the state of the world before the test, when I exercise the behavior under test, then we expect the following changes, right? GWT, sometimes people think, oh, hey, we went away and we fixed TDD and we created this, created this new thing given when then, right? That's exactly how it's been since the beginning, right? Given when then is just a, another way of expressing that same concept. That's basically how you do TDD. Um, it's the same as a fourfold test, which is uh, set up given exercise when or verify, verify it then and tear down, right? So set up, exercise, verify and tear down. 
which has been encoded into um, X unit tools since the dawn of time, right? And it's the same as after range and assert, which has the same set of principles. Testing is about doing, uh, uh, expressing a behavior and then writing tests, the smallest piece of code we can to move from where we are towards implementing that behavior. And that is, is it is this that led Dan to make this statement, right? So Dan originally made this statement very early on in TDD history. And his point was, um, uh, test to behavior, TDD's behavior driven development was, if I, the, the word test to confuse people, it has started bringing in ideas like unit testing, acceptance testing, and integration testing. And the key to what we were doing was actually behavior. So that's the key, not anything that came after in BDD, right? I don't want, and I'm not particularly advocating for BDD. I think BDD has some of its basically own, own sets of issues, particularly its outside in model and its current dependency on acceptance testing, right? But originally the observation of BDD was its behaviors that you are dealing with, in, it's the contracts that you are dealing with in TDD. Um, so BDD originally, when, when Dan created this blog post, it was just an alternative name for TDD. So alternative way of naming it to express that basically the key thing was behaviors or contracts, not tests. You could call it contract-driven um, development. That'd be an equally valid name for what Kent was basically expressing. He just called it TDD because it manifested itself in these executable specifications or tests that he'd written. And so, uh, although I mentioned BDD, I'm not advocating for BDD. As I say, I think it has its own set of problems. I think it's lost its way from what the original idea was. So the rule in, in TDD is that the, the next uh, test you write is the most obvious step in implementing a use case or user story, right? And in a sense, that's the question that answers everything, right? The question of what test do I write next? is the most obvious step towards implementing a requirement. I've got a blank sheet of paper, what do I write? I, have a I should have a requirement from a customer which says there's something I need in the, in the domain, right? And the next test I write is the most obvious thing I can take in taking a small step towards implementing that. Maybe I have some acceptance criteria from the customer about that requirement. Maybe I can look at the simplest of those acceptance criteria and code that into a test, right? What's the, what's, the, what's the smallest change I can make to the existing system to move closer towards implementing this particular behavior that the customer has asked for? Right. Test that. TDD is all an agile, it's all about small steps. If I make a small change and it goes wrong, I haven't got much to throw away, right? Make a big change, then I'm very un uninclined to throw it away when it goes wrong. And I spend ages trying to hack it around it, right? I recently, um, and I found, uh, had that experience basically on a, a on Brighton, the open source project. I realized that um, rather than trying to make something uh, work, it was just easier basically effectively to rewrite it because whatever decisions I've made in the past were lost to me and it was quicker to go in and rewrite the whole thing, right? And I had tests that helped me do that. Um, uh, and that resolved that issue. And in the same way, moving in small steps, I should take advantage of that idea that basically maybe that step doesn't work throw it away, uh, try rewriting it. And it's important to understand that it's we're focused on use cases and user stories, right? User, story, user, user stories are just light, lightweight use cases. Right? And it's that which effectively drives our TDD. We have a user story which we're given, the customer basically says, I want this thing to happen. And when we work with the customer, we have a set of acceptance criteria that give us essentially rules that we can say, Hey, when this happens, that happens, right? These are, the, these are some numbers we can crunch to prove that. And it's that, that's, that's what we said we should say about TDD. Hey, what's the user story? What's the, what's the behavior, what's the acceptance criteria? That's what I'm testing, right? What's the smallest thing I can do to get towards that? So if you go and look at, for example, Ron Jeffrey's um, work where effectively his catters and stuff where he's building, for example, the bowling game. You go and look at what he's doing, right? What he's doing is taking behaviors about scoring a bowling game. And at each time around, he's saying, what's the smallest thing I can do to move towards basically that set of behavior? So I've got a, um, on my GitHub, a copy basically effectively of uh, kind of his rules. And he just, he got a set of acceptance criteria, 
that basically say, what, how, how do I want to see a bowling game work, right? And you can just work your way through that. Um, so if TDD is capturing these requirements, this is my big objection to BDD. If TDD is dealing with these use cases and user stories. You might ask the question, well, hang on a minute. Isn't that what acceptance tests do? And we'll come back to that. Um, and the thing we mentioned earlier, right? In the refactoring step, right? I don't have to introduce new tests if I break out new classes or new methods. They are placed under test by the original test that you have. Your test gives you coverage, essentially, of that of the, of what of what that change you just made. When you refactor that change you just made, and refactoring is usually safe steps which don't introduce new paths, et cetera, then effectively, even if I say, oh, I'm gonna create some new methods, or you know what, I want a little helper class to deal with that. I don't need new tests. The tests are on the behavior, not on, ex not on each individual class. If I need eight classes to implement that, that's great. I only necessarily need one test. The test probably, should be focused on what is exported from the module. There's other things in a language that supports that should be implementation data which are hidden and not exported from the module. So I'm thinking internals in C sharp or you know single underscore in Python in a module, right? Things that effectively you don't expose, but those things don't need individual tests. And in refactoring, you often find that you're building that class hierarchy. All you've got effectively under test is the facade, and that's great because it means somebody else can come in, throw away your implementation rebuild it actually and provide the test or pass know that their rework has been a good solution to the problem okay. remember that refactoring is changing the implementation without changing the behavior if you're doing anything else you're not doing refactoring right um, okay you mentioned that the application are exported um uh yeah it could be a new class as well all right okay um and so remember that you need to follow this step red green refactor green get your goal is effectively to find the algorithm as fast as possible, but not to write clean code. You've got clean code and a refactoring step. Right? Refactoring is where you apply patterns because you, I understand what the, what, what the algorithm is to solve this problem now. Now I know what the context I have is. Now I know if a pattern is an appropriate choice. Right? So now I understand what complexity. I write a complex enough solution to the problem and no more. I recommend usually going and reading a book called uh, 99 Bottles of Beer um, by Sandy Metz. Uh, it's a great exploration. I don't necessarily quite agree with some of the statements about TDD, but it's a great exploration of this idea of using tests to avoid um, increasing the complexity of your code. All right, customers write acceptance tests. Um, uh, that's another fallacy, unfortunately. Um, we don't really want to do that, okay. So uh, where did this idea come from? So the idea originally came from this, idea, this principle that we had an on-site customer nowadays in XP. Nowadays, we think about that as being, say, for example, the product owner. And the product owner, the idea was, would essentially help us with defining the requirements, um, looking at the acceptance criteria and testing, basically, the code. Right. And so one of the, uh, the, the kind of real stretch goal was basically was, well, why can't the customer actually write the test? Right. And then the obstacle was seen as being, well, they can't write the test because they're not a developer. Well, what if we created tools that let them write it in their own language or just fill in a table in an HTML table? They could write the tests. So the, the idea behind acceptance testing was originally customers would come in and write the tests for us. And that's why we have a DSL like Cucumber or basically we have a wiki page or um, an HTML table and something like Fit so that the customers can write the tests directly. How many of you actually have customers writing those? Did you use Specflow or Cucumber because your customer sits with your team and writes the tests? If you didn't, why are you doing that? Why not just you write your tests in an X unit tool? What advantage have you gained by putting it into basically another format? which you then have to write some translation from and regex parsing and fiddle all that around in order to then run your X unit, an X unit tool effectively. Probably zero. And I've never really seen this work. I've never even seen customers review them. 
all they am is an additional burden on the team because they're complicated and hard to maintain. Right. And my other question would be if I'm doing unit testing properly, I'm doing TDD rather properly, right? I'm doing TDD. Well, I've already got tests on my behaviors that express the acceptance criteria described by the customer. That's what my TDD's got. What are these acceptance cases giving me? There's no difference. So James Shaw is the person that wrote, one of the people that helped write FIT originally with Walt Cunning. So James has skin in the game, right? He, he's basically one of the people that helped write it. Um, also, James's books on XP are great. Um, uh, if you really want to understand how the XP philosophy worked, if you if you, if you you missed out on that the first time around, or you only experienced Scrum, go and read basically his Art of Agile Development. Um, uh, his problem is basically, he, he, he pointed this out. He said, I've abandoned using FIT. The tool that I wrote, I've abandoned using it because it doesn't work. Right. And it's because because effectively customers don't do it. And if customers don't do it, don't do it. But that tool only exists for customer participation for the product owner. If your product owner is not writing the tests in your cucumber suite, don't do it. Right. Um, because they're more expensive. They create a maintenance burden. They spend much of their life red because generally the, the, the pattern and process you use says, um, I write them at the beginning, they're read until I get all the implementation, all the, all the implementation written. And that means you have whole suites that are supposed to be read for a period of time, right? And that's really antithetical to the way that TDD works, where effectively our suite should be green most of the time. And it tends to be people ignoring those tests because they're read because there's things in there that haven't been built yet. And then you get this crunch at the end of the iteration where everyone goes, hey, we've got to fix the acceptance tests, right? Um, and I think ATDD and I think BDD bears basically a certain amount of responsibility for this, unfortunately, has really um, broken our, uh, under our understanding of TDD because the need in order to justify ATDD, basically, because we already have tests of the acceptance criteria for the behavior expressed by the customer, that's TDD. In order to justify ATDD, we have to effectively um, degrade TDD to just testing units. So we've added all this unnecessary complexity, right? All these unnecessary tools that basically effectively are required to do DSLs, which the developer is writing themselves, not the customer, to express the behavior which TDD should have been expressing in an X unit tool, which would have given us fast binary feedback. So really, if you're using these today, just ditch them. And again, this is the point from Kent originally. This is a, Kent wrote this originally in, in TDD by example, talking about ATDD, which I think people are raising then and saying, just don't do it, right? Because you stare at a red bar for too long. Because these tests essentially must be read until all the implementation is done. Just rely on unit tests. Right. Uh, customer specify acceptance criteria is what we really want instead, right? So this is the way that James just working. Um, uh, sometimes called example-driven uh, development, but it's really just TDD. Um, but if you want another name for this kind of TDD, you could call it example-driven development. But customers illustrate examples, and the developers basically use the examples as a guide to write their tests. We see in the elaboration, the customer says, this is the user story, here are the acceptance criteria, um, uh, and we then we use those to write our unit tests, our, our TDD tests. Right? Even I say unit tests, it's just become saying so ingrained, but developer tests. Okay. And that's where we get stuff going to code from. Okay, it doesn't matter if you test first or you test last. That's another fallacy that seems to come up. People say, well, um, it doesn't matter. I still get the same test coverage, right? I, and, and people say, I, I've seen people actually literally say, I like to explore my code. So what I do is I write something at the very top level of the outside contract. And then I go in, in small bits, filling in individual details, stubbing stuff out until I get to the end and then I write the, then I, then I write the test to express that. And you're kind of like, uh, okay, that's TDD, right? So the problem is uh, you say, I want to execute unit tests after the development of tests, right? And that's classical testing, right? Classical testing is testing at the end of the line, where essentially you say, once I've written something, I'll then write tests to regression proof it. So your modeling has to occur where in advance are you getting tests, right? So the feedback comes after your model has been created by you, perhaps with CRC cards and whiteboards, 
um, but also by the process of implementation. At the end, when you're complete, you see if that model was any good. Then what happens if the model is no good, right? Generally speaking, people are very reluctant to go back and throw away all that code that they've just written, realizing the tests have now told them at the end that their model was rubbish, okay? What they tend to do is then hack their model to make it work. And so if you are doing test after, you are essentially saying, I prefer waterfall style development. That's what you're saying. I prefer, I prefer design up front um, and then test at the end, classic phased waterfall development. That's, that's your approach. And that's okay if that's what you really want to do, but please wear that shirt proudly. That's what you have signed up to, right? Test last is no, is, is, there's no relation to test driven development. Um, one of the key issues here is this long feedback loop, right? The idea behind TDD is we move quality left, move quality up the line, right? Give you feedback on design decisions as you make them. And you can do that by red green refactor. You can't do that by a test after. And unfortunately, unit testing uh, unit and integration testing and all that uh, shenanigans, along with mock objects, implicitly push you into test after. Even if you're writing tests at the same time, you have really done the design already, and effectively you are then just trying to basically um, write a test that encapsulate that design. Yeah. Um, one of the problems here is that you're engaging in speculation, right? You're writing speculative code. How do you know when you're done, right? Surely done basically is I've met the requirements given to me by the customer. But quite often in this model, people go away and write a whole lot of code, and then they add the test at the end, which can find the behavior the customer wanted. And it may turn out that half the code was completely unnecessary, right? You slowed yourself down considerably because you've delivered stuff the customer didn't need. And you may say, oh, the customer will need that. I know I'm smart. The customer always wants that. But how do you know until you actually see what the customer wants, whether your implementation is right? And your tendency will be to say, oh yeah, it's not quite what I built. I can hack what I built to make that work, right? If you'd waited and found out what the actual requirement was, when it came, if it came, you write better code. So the, the, the thing we need to understand is that we should basically only write production code in response to a test. That's one of the key principles of TDD, okay? We only write a test in response to a requirement. So we can't write speculative code. There's a path from requirement to test the thing that I implemented. If I come to write my tests and, custom, and I, don't, I don't know what the acceptance criteria are, I don't know what the behavior is, and I, and I've, and I feel like I'm stalled, well, Actually, that's a prompt, right? It's a prompt to say, we don't understand this story well enough. Let's get the product owner or the customer back into the room. Let's talk to them. And let's find out what we should actually be building. All right. Um, as Ken's kind of key point here is, TDD gives us two things. It gives us design, contract first design, and it gives us scope control, right? We don't write unnecessary code. And that's what we test first. All right, you want 100% test coverage of your code. Hopefully you're beginning to see that this one probably, probably won't um, uh, work now. Even TDD basically um, can at some point says, TDD for religious issues result in 100% coverage of code. But that's because if we do TDD right, right? If we're, following, if we're writing programmer tests, we're basically following behaviors, et cetera, um, and we are writing our tests first, we're never writing any code that wasn't prompted by a test. So we can't write tests that basically doesn't have 100% coverage because why would we have written code that didn't have a test over it? We'd only get discrepancies if what we were doing was essentially test first or test first by, by the process of introducing unit tests because unit tests always are, are a test after strategy. And so as soon as you try and do unit tests, you will effectively end up like doing test after, even if you are simultaneously writing them. Or untested branches and refactoring. So if our refactoring step goes wrong, we may well find that essentially we introduce a branch, we get carried away. And that is the point effectively of co-coverage tools, which basically said at the beginning of the refactoring, 
I have this much coverage at the end of the refactoring, I should have the same amount of coverage. I shouldn't basically have introduced new paths into the code. If I have, it should highlight to me, hey, you introduced this new path and nothing in the test expresses that. So you take that path out and then you write the test that basically expresses that particular behavior. If you can confirm that is a genuine requirement. Of course, we do actually have less than 100%, right? Quite often. So, so why is that? Is, is that because we've got problems, right? Is that because essentially um, uh, uh, things happen in the past that are wrong? One of the things that uh, we need to understand at this point is not all of our code should be driven by test driven development. Right? TDD is suitable really for expressing our, our finding our domain finding basically the behaviors of that domain and how it works. It's not super full of other things. It's not test first development, not the process we're describing here, right? TDD's process is to find fast binary feedback, right? What we don't want to do therefore is drive tests about things that are fragile or slow or potentially um, where effectively exploratory testing would give us better, better, better feedback. Okay. We don't drive spikes or the throwaway code. Uh, spike is basically how we find stuff out. You don't no point writing tests around it. it. The feedback is the spike, right? You don't have integration, right? If you basically need essentially to figure out whether your configuration is for your your the data for your database mapping is correct, that's not a TDD process. You're not exploring a behavior, right? Run some code and see if it works. That's the way you get feedback. And if you're worried about it changing, sure. Write a test and maybe use an XUnit tool after the protection against regression. But that's not our TDD objective, right? TDD is about getting a, a feedback on the behaviors that you're encoding to the system. It's not about confirming that you can follow the instructions on how to use your ORM correctly. Um, don't if, if tests are things that are fragile and will continue to break, like things that are just over network con connections, right? Don't do TDD around things that are slow so that you don't get fast binary feedback and everyone doesn't run the tests all the time because it takes 20 minutes to run the test suite. Just use a test after approach to make sure they're regression tested if you need to. And often the fastest feedback is simply to run them, not to write tests at all. The goal of TDD is fast feedback on design decisions. That's what it's there for. Right? If you can get faster feedback by a different mechanism, use that instead. Okay, don't go third party code, it's not yours either, right? Um, yeah. So if not all your code is TDD, your entire code base won't have 100% coverage. Don't worry about that. Focus your TDD efforts on the things that make sense for TDD, which is really around your domain model. And that leads to the kind of idea of testing pyramid, which kind of says, um, you know, TDD is part of strategy. Because TDD basically is a cheap way of getting very fast feedback, then we should focus basically on making sure that our use cases, the behavior requirements of the system are driven by TDD. Um, as we move up the stack, we may want to use other techniques, right? Where effectively it's IO, we may want to automate and re check regression, but we want to test that after, right? We want to think monitoring and alerting is part of our, our, our quality strategy, right? It tells us about the behavior system, gives us feedback about things that you might not be able to explore easily otherwise. Distributed systems fail in all sorts of interesting ways that TDD is never gonna discover for you, right? Um, and exploratory testing, which basically asks the question, which is the opposite of TDD. TDD is asking the question, you know, how do I build this requirement of things that I want? Exploratory testing is your QA saying, let me break this thing, right? Uh, by using it in new and unexpected ways. And all these things are valuable, but the, the higher up the ladder they are, the more expensive they are, the slower they are, and effectively, therefore, the, the longer the time to feedback and the more cost to get feedback. So get the cheap feedback if you can at TDD and then go up the ladder as you need to. All right, so clean architecture is one I always recommend as being a real help to doing TDD. Okay, this is a classic clean architecture model. So clean architecture is just the generic name that's been created around hexagonal, onion, BCE. There are a whole set of patterns that really just are the same thing. Um, uh, and then really the key characteristic basically is that you have essentially a series of layers. In the center, you have your entities, which essentially are, is your domain model, if you like. Um, around that, you have a domain service layer, which essentially is expressing um, 
uh, the use cases, right? We think of them as ports in hexagonal architecture. I quite often think of them as commands, right? Things that basically say, um, here is a requirement which may involve a number of entities. Um, so that's the behavior, right? Around that we have where you integrate with frameworks and other things that you need. So it's right where you write, write, write your controller, but so that your web framework can call you and pass you the HTTP request as parameters. It's where you talk to your messaging platform. It's where you talk to your database, right? And beyond that is actually the frameworks and the drivers that your system needs. And the key idea in all clean architectures, it depends inwards, right? So things on the outer layer can call things on the inner layer, but not in reverse, which tends to be why we need basically um, uh, interfaces, because if my use case wants to basically write to a database, um, then what it needs to do basically is have an interface that gets realized by, by a concrete uh, database application by the outer layer, right? That's all layers are about. That's all really injection or basically interfaces which should be about. It's about layering. Right. Okay. So given that, we can look something like that. This, right? Delivery mechanism, boundary, interactor, entity. Boundary basically effectively is things like controllers. Interactor effectively is our use cases. Entity is the things we're dealing with. We may have something like an entity gateway. That means go and get stuff from storage, right? When we have a request model and a response model because our entities effectively can't leave, uh, can't go up beyond our interactor. So essentially our boundary effectively has to deal with something else instead that the interactor deals with, right? You can't, you, it, it, it's, a, it's a rule from Jakobson, but you basically, your boundary shouldn't talk directly to your entity. It should always go through the interactor layer in between. There's no bypass. Um, and you really shouldn't be passing your entity back up, therefore be directly exposed. That's where you get DTOs, right? Request models and response models. Okay, given we know that, it seems clear that basically we should write most of the majority of our tests against the use case layer. Because tests exercise use cases or user stories. That's where I write most of my TDD. And if I have an interactor like a command or I've got a dispatch model, so I've got a command and a handler, that's where I write most of my tests. Our X unit. To suite is just another adapter. It's another thing driving it, right? And we can also essentially see that may, maybe it makes sense at this point, both from the depends inwards nature of this architecture and from the, the symmetry of where we sit to say that some of these things on the outside, the IO things that are fragile and slow, look like they're good candidates for things we should block, right? Sometimes the use case is too coarse grained and I need to be a bit more fine grained and I can switch down to entities. Kent calls this notion gears. It's, a, it's, it's one of the craziest explained things. And I didn't realize America, so many Americans understood how, how stick shifts work. But the idea effectively is I choose a suitable gear. So high gear most of the time, low gear when things get tricky. So you can shift down to entities as things get tricky. But this is what it looks like. I've got an X unit framework driving a test. The test has a request model and a response model, right? So you can tell that you're dealing with the API for software implementation details because it generally exposes primitives, not domain objects. Right, because the, the, your APIs are much better at exposing primitive structures not and, and things that are defined at its level, not the things inside. So it interacts and then the entities before. It. And then essentially you can have a delivery mechanism which has some kind of in-memory DB but for faking out purposes for the test. Okay, so your test is just driving the same code that other things drive. Don't TDD other adapters. Generally they're provided to you by a framework. They should have tests that are running basically to prove that they work. And don't TTDS your controller effectively, et cetera, and use that as your starting point. It's dealing with issues like HTTP. It should be skinny and just hand over work to your use case. Right. It's a, another adapter like XUnit. If you need confirmation of stuff, you may want to have some kind of scripted test that trace end to end that show you the whole thing hangs together and that essentially you haven't, you know, fluffed up when you've basically been uh, doing your routing table in your controller or assigning your ORM uh, mappings that you need, right? You only need a few of those just to test a happy path, trace the whole thing hangs together for you. And that's really about those configuration concerns, which is really what they are. Um, all right, let's basically summarize um, the fallacies, developers write unit tests, trigger for a new test is a new function, Customers write acceptance tests. Doesn't matter if you test first or last and you want 100% test coverage of your code, right? Principles you should be following, you should be writing developer or programmer tests, 
right? Like the trigger for, trigger for you to write a test should be a new behavior. Um, the customer should be writing acceptance criteria. Um, you should only write production code in response to a test, but not all of your code should be driven by TDD. All right, and we're done. Thanks very much. Um, I can I will hang out for questions uh, at the but I know it's a break, so um, people are probably on silent recording, but I will hang out if people want to chat.